From the Conference Center in Salt Lake City, Utah, this is the Sunday morning session of the 194th Annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, with speakers selected from leaders of the church. Music for this session is provided by the Tabernacle Choir at Temple Square. This broadcast is furnished as a public service by Bonneville Distribution. Any reproduction, recording, transcription, or other use of this program without written consent is prohibited. President Henry B. Eyring, second counselor in the first presidency of the church, will conduct this session. Brothers and sisters, we welcome you to the Sunday morning session of the 194th Annual General Conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. President Russell M. Nelson, who is viewing this session from home, has asked me to conduct this session. We extend our greetings to those of you who are participating in these proceedings throughout the world by radio, television, the internet, or satellite transmission. We acknowledge the general authorities and general officers who are in attendance at this morning. The music for this session will be provided by the Tabernacle Choir at Temple Square under the direction of Mac Wilberg and Ryan Murphy and Richard Elliott and Brian Mathias at the organ. We are pleased to have individuals from outside the United States joining the choir during the conference. They live in Argentina, Austria, Chile, Denmark, England, France, Ghana, Guatemala, Sweden, and South Korea. We welcome you and appreciate your participation. The choir opened this meeting with Awake and Arise. And now will favor us with, Come, ye children of the Lord. The invocation will then be offered by Elder Vehagenga Sikahema of the Seventy. Let us raise our hands. 
Our dear, eternal Heavenly Father, we humbly and joyfully come before Thee in the act of prayer this beautiful Sabbath morning, expressing our love and gratitude to Thee for Thy beloved Son, Jesus Christ, for His atoning sacrifice. We're grateful for the technology that allows us to meet and gather throughout the world as Thy people and as believers. We pray for thy prophet, President Nelson, and his two able counselors, the Quorum of the Twelve, and all those who will participate in this, this day's program, that they teach us with power and with authority, instructing us in our duties more perfectly in theory, in principle, and in doctrine. We pray, Father, for the rising generation, for our missionaries, their leaders, our service missionaries and our senior couples throughout the world who gather ancient Israel and are building thy kingdom upon the earth. Finally, we pray, Father, for the courage to act upon the things that we hear with our ears and the impressions that will come to our hearts from thy spirit. We now dedicate this meeting unto thee in the name of thy beloved Son, even Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We will now be pleased to hear from Elder Ronald A. Rasband of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. He will be followed by President Susan H. Porter who serves as primary general president. After her remarks, the choir will sing a child's prayer. We will then hear from Elder Dale G. Renland of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles and Elder Paul B. Piper of the Seventy. Thank you, dear President Eyring. We all love you dearly. <clears throat> Brothers, sisters, and friends across the world, I am honored to address this vast audience, many of whom are members of our Church and many of whom are friends and new listeners to this conference broadcast. Welcome. The messages from this pulpit are communicated in words. They are given in English and translated into nearly 100 different languages. Always the base is the same, words. And words matter a lot. Let me say that again, words matter. They are the bedrock of how we connect. They represent our beliefs, morals, and perspectives. Sometimes we speak words, other times we listen. Words set a tone. They voice our thoughts, feelings, and experiences, for good or bad. Unfortunately, words can be thoughtless, hasty, and hurtful. Once said, we cannot take them back. They can wound, punish, cut down, and even lead to destructive actions they can weigh heavily on us. On the other hand, words can celebrate victory, be hopeful and encouraging. They can prompt us to rethink, reboot, and redirect our course. Words can open our minds to truth. That is why, first and foremost, the Lord's words matter. In the Book of Mormon, the prophet Alma and his people in ancient America encountered endless warfare with those who had disregarded the word of God, hardened their hearts, and corrupted their culture. The faithful could have fought, but Alma counseled. And now, as the preaching of the word had a great tendency to lead the people to do that which was just, yea, it had had more powerful effect 
upon the minds of the people than the sword or anything else which had happened unto them. Therefore Alma thought it was expedient that they should try the virtue of the Word of God. The Word of God surpasses all other expressions. It has been so since the creation of the earth when the Lord spoke, let there be light, and there was light. From the Savior came these assurances in the New Testament. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. And this, if a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. And from Mary, the mother of Jesus, came this humble testimony, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. Believing and heeding the word of God will draw us closer to him. President Russell M. Nelson has promised, if you will study his words, your ability to be more like him will increase. Don't we all want to be, as the hymn says, more blessed and holy, more Savior like thee? I picture young Joseph Smith on his knees hearing the words of his Father in heaven. Joseph, this is my beloved son. Hear him. We hear him in the words of Scripture, but do we just let them sit on the page, or do we recognize he is speaking to us? Do we change? We hear him in personal revelation and promptings from the Holy Ghost, in answers to prayer, and those moments when only Jesus Christ through the power of His Atonement can lift our burdens, grant us forgiveness and peace, and embrace us in the arms of His love. Second, the words of prophets matter. Prophets testify of the divinity of Jesus Christ. They teach His gospel and show His love for all. I bear my witness that our living prophet, President Russell M. Nelson, hears and speaks the word of the Lord. President Nelson has a way with words. He has said, keep on the covenant path, gather Israel, let God prevail, build bridges of understanding, give thanks, increase faith in Jesus Christ, take charge of your testimony, and become a peacemaker. Most recently, he has asked us to think celestial. When you are confronted with a dilemma, he said, think celestial. When tested by temptation, think celestial. When life or loved ones let you down, think celestial. When someone dies prematurely, think celestial. When the pressures of life crowd in upon you, think celestial. As you think celestial, your heart will gradually change you and view trials and opposition in a new light, and your faith will increase. When we think celestial, we see things as they really are and really will be. In this world burdened with confusion and contention, we all need that perspective. Elder George Albert Smith, long before becoming president of the Church, spoke of sustaining the prophet and heeding his words. He said, The obligation that we make when we raise our hands is a most sacred one. It means that we will stand behind him, we will pray for him, and we will strive to carry out his instructions as the Lord shall direct. In other words, we will diligently act upon our prophet's words. As one of 15 prophets, seers, and revelators sustained yesterday by our worldwide church, I want to share with you one of my experiences sustaining the prophet and embracing his words. It was for me, much like the prophet Jacob, who recounted, I had heard the voice of the Lord speaking unto me in very word. Last October, my wife Melanie and I 
were in Bangkok, Thailand, as we were preparing to dedicate what would be the church's 185th temple. For me, the assignment was both surreal and humbling. This was the first house of the Lord on the Southeast Asia Peninsula. It was masterfully designed, a six-story, nine-spired structure, fitly framed to be a house of the Lord. For months, I had contemplated the dedication. What had settled in my soul and mind was that the country and the temple had been cradled in the arms of apostles and prophets. President Thomas S. Monson had announced the temple and President Nelson the dedication. I had prepared the dedicatory prayer months earlier. Those sacred words had been translated into 12 languages. We were ready, or so I thought. The night before the dedication, I was awakened from my sleep with an unsettled, urgent feeling about the dedicatory prayer. I tried to set it aside, put that prompting away, but the Spirit would not leave me alone. I sensed certain words were missing, and by divine design they came to me in revelation, and I inserted these words in the prayer near the end. May we think celestial, letting thy spirit prevail in our lives and strive to be peacemakers always. The Lord was reminding me to heed the words of our living prophet. Think celestial, let the spirit prevail, strive to be peacemakers. Words of the prophet matter to the Lord and to us. Now, third, and so very important, are our own words. Believe me, in our emoji-filled world, our words matter. Our words can be supportive or angry, joyful or mean, compassionate or tossed aside. In the heat of the moment, words can sting and sink painfully deep into the soul and stay there. Our words on the internet, texting, social media, or tweets take on a life of their own. So be careful what you say and how you say it. In our families, especially with husbands and wives and children, our words can bring us together or drive a wedge between us. Let me suggest three simple phrases that we can use to take the sting out of difficulties and differences, lift and reassure each other. Thank you, I am sorry, and I love you. Do not save these humble phrases for a special event or catastrophe. Use them often and sincerely, for they show regard for others. Talk is growing cheap. Do not follow that pattern. We can say thank you on the elevator, in the parking lot, at the market, or in the office in a queue or with our neighbors or friends. We can say, I am sorry, when we make a mistake, miss a meeting, forget a birthday, or see someone in pain. We can say, I love you. And those words carry the message, I am thinking about you, I care about you, I am here for you, or you are everything to me. Let me share a personal example. Husbands, take heed, and sisters, this is going to help you too. Before my full-time assignment in the Church, I traveled widely for my company. I was gone a fair amount of time to far reaches of the world. At the end of my day, no matter where I was, I always called home. When my wife Melanie picked up the phone and I reported in, our conversation always led to expressing, I love you. Every day, those words served as an anchor to my soul and my conduct. They were a protection to me from evil designs. Melanie, I love you, spoke of the precious trust between us. President Thomas S. Monson used to say, There are feet to steady, hands to grasp, minds to inspire, and souls to save. Saying thank you, I am sorry, I love you, 
will do just that. Brothers and sisters, words do matter. I promise that if we feast upon the words of Christ that lead to salvation, our prophet's words that guide and encourage us, and our own words that speak of who we are and what we hold dear, the powers of heaven will pour down upon us. The words of Christ will tell you all things what you should do. We are his children, and he is our God, and he expects us to speak with the tongue of angels by the power of the Holy Ghost. I love the Lord Jesus Christ. He is, in the words of the Old Testament prophet Isaiah, wonderful, counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And as the Apostle John made clear, Jesus Christ himself is the Word. Of this I testify, as an apostle called to the Lord's divine service to declare his Word and called to stand as a special witness of him. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. amen. Thank you, Elder Rasband. Brothers and sisters, I feel joy as I respond to an impression to speak to children. Girls and boys, wherever you are in the world, I want to share something with you. Our Heavenly Father loves you. You are his child. He knows you. He wants to bless you. I pray with all my heart that you will feel his love. Do you like to receive gifts? I want to talk to you about a very special gift that Heavenly Father has given to help you. It is the gift of prayer. What a blessing prayer is. We can talk to Heavenly Father anytime, anywhere. When Jesus was on the earth, he taught us to pray. He said, ask and ye shall receive. What gifts can you pray for? There are many, but today I want to share three. Pray to know, pray to grow, and pray to show. Let's talk about each one. First, pray to know. What do you need to know? There is a song about prayer that primary children sing all over the world. It starts with a question. Do you know what that song is? If I were really brave, I would sing it to you. <laughs> Heavenly Father, are you really there? And do you hear and answer every child's prayer? How can you know that Heavenly Father is really there even when you can't see him? President Russell M. Nelson has invited you to pour out your heart to your Heavenly Father and then listen. Listen to what you feel in your heart and thoughts that come to your mind. Heavenly Father has a glorified body of flesh and bones and is the Father of your spirit. Because Heavenly Father has all power and knows all things, He can see all His children and can hear and answer every prayer. You can come to know for yourself that He is there and that He loves you. When you know that Heavenly Father is real and that He loves you, you can live with courage and hope. Pray, he is there. Speak, he is listening. Have you ever felt alone? One day when our granddaughter Ashley was six years old, she was the only one without a friend to play with on the school playground. As she stood there feeling unimportant and unseen, 
a specific thought came into her mind. Wait, I'm not alone. I have Christ. Ashley knelt down right in the middle of the playground, folded her arms, and prayed to Heavenly Father. The moment she opened her eyes, a girl her age was standing there asking her if she wanted to play. Ashley came to know we are important to the Lord and we are never truly alone. Sometimes you may want to know why something hard is happening in your life or why you didn't receive a blessing you prayed for. Often, the best question to ask Heavenly Father is not why, but what. Do you remember when Nephi and his family were hungry while they were traveling in the wilderness? When Nephi and his brothers went to hunt for food, Nephi broke his bow. But he didn't ask why. Nephi made a new bow and asked his father Lehi where he could go to get food. Lehi prayed, and the Lord showed them where Nephi could go. Heavenly Father will guide you when you ask him what you can do and what you can learn. Second, pray to grow. Heavenly Father wants to help you grow. He loves us so much that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to show us the way to live. Jesus suffered, died, and was resurrected so we can be forgiven of our sins and grow to become more like him. Do you want to grow in patience or in honesty? Do you want to grow in a skill? Maybe you are shy and want to grow in courage. Pray, he is there. Through his spirit, your heart can change and you can receive strength. My new friend Jonah wrote, I often feel nervous on my way to school in the morning. I worry about things like being late, forgetting something, and taking tests. When I was 10, I started saying prayers on my drive to school with my mom. I ask for the help I need, and I pray for my family, too. I also think of the things I'm grateful for. Praying to Heavenly Father has helped me. Sometimes I don't feel the relief right as I get out of the car, but by the time I'm at my classroom, I feel peaceful. Jonah's faith is growing as he prays every day and then moves forward. Third, pray to show. You can pray for help to show Heavenly Father's love to others. Through His Spirit, Heavenly Father will help you notice someone who is sad so you can comfort them. He can help you show His love by forgiving someone. He can give you courage to serve someone and share with them that they are a child of God. You can help others come to know and love Jesus and Heavenly Father as you do. For my whole life, I prayed that my father would become a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Even as a young girl, I knew how many blessings he could receive. Our family could receive the blessings of being sealed for eternity. My family, friends, and I prayed often for him, but he didn't join the Church. Heavenly Father does not force anyone to make a choice. He can send us answers to our prayers in other ways. When I was old enough, I received my patriarchal blessing. In the blessing, 
the patriarch told me the best thing I could do to help my family be together in heaven was to be an example of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what I could do. My father lived to be 86. Five days after he died, I received a sacred feeling of joy. Heavenly Father let me know through his spirit that my father wanted to receive the blessings of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I will never forget the day I knelt around the altar in the temple with my sister and brothers to be sealed to my parents. I had started praying for this blessing when I was in primary, and I received it when I was a grandmother. Perhaps you are praying for blessings for your family and others you love. Don't give up. Heavenly Father will show you what you can do. Share with Heavenly Father what is in your heart. As you sincerely ask for His help, you will receive His Spirit to guide you. Praying every day will fill you with love for Heavenly Father in Jesus Christ. This will help you want to follow them your whole life. Imagine what would happen if all the children in Africa, South America, Asia, Europe, North America, and Australia prayed every day. The whole world would be blessed with more of God's love. I invite you to pray to know Heavenly Father is there. Pray to grow to become like Him and pray to show His love to others. I know He lives and loves you. Pray He is there. In the sacred name of Jesus Christ, amen.
Years ago, my wife Ruth, our daughter Ashley, and I joined other tourists on a kayaking excursion in the state of Hawaii in the United States. A kayak is a low-to-the-water, canoe-like boat in which the rower sits facing forward and uses a double-bladed paddle to pull front to back on one side and then on the other. The plan was to row to two small islands off the coast of Oahu and back again. I was confident because, as a young man, I had paddled kayaks across mountain lakes. Hubris never bodes well, does it? Our guide gave us instructions and showed us the ocean kayaks we would use. They differed from the ones I'd previously paddled. I was supposed to sit on top of the kayak instead of down inside it. When I got onto the kayak, my center of gravity was higher than I was accustomed to, and I was less stable in the water. As we started out, I rode faster than Ruth and Ashley. After a while, I was far ahead of them. Though proud of my heroic pace, I stopped paddling and waited for them to catch up. A large wave, this big, <laughs> about 13 centimeters, hit the side of my kayak and flipped me over into the water. By the time I had turned the kayak upright and struggled to get back on top, Ruth and Ashley had passed me by, but I was too winded to resume paddling. Before I could catch my breath, another wave, this one truly enormous, this big, <laughs> at least 20 centimeters, hit my kayak and flipped me over again. By the time I managed to right the kayak, I was so out of breath, I feared I wouldn't be able to climb on top. Seeing my situation, the guide rode over, steadied my kayak, making it easier for me to climb on top. When he saw that I was still too breathless to row on my own, he hitched a tow rope to my kayak and began paddling, pulling me along with him. Soon I caught my breath and began paddling adequately on my own. He let go of the rope, and I reached the first island without further assistance. Upon arrival, I flopped down on the sand, exhausted. After the group had rested, the guide quietly said to me, Mr. Renland, if you just keep paddling, maintaining your momentum, I think you're going to be fine. I followed his advice as we paddled to the second island and then back to our starting point. Twice, the guide rode by and told me I was doing great. <laughs> Even larger waves hit my kayak from the side, but I wasn't flipped over. By consistently paddling the kayak, I maintained momentum and forward progress, mitigating the effect of waves hitting me from the side. The same principle applies in our spiritual lives. We become vulnerable when we slow down, and especially when we stop. If we maintain spiritual momentum by continually rowing toward the Savior, we're safer and more secure because our eternal life depends on our faith in Him. Spiritual momentum is created over a lifetime as we repeatedly embrace the doctrine of Christ. Doing so, President Russell M. Nelson taught, produces a powerful, virtuous cycle. Indeed, the elements of the doctrine of Christ, such as faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, repentance, entering a covenant relationship with the Lord through baptism, receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost, and enduring to the end, are not intended to be experienced as one-time check-the-box events. In particular, enduring to the end is not really a separate step in the doctrine of Christ. As though we complete the first four elements, then hunker down, grit our teeth, and wait to die. No, enduring to the end is repeatedly and iteratively applying the other elements of the doctrine of Christ, 
creating the powerful, virtuous cycle that President Nelson described. Repeatedly means that we experience the elements of the doctrine of Christ over and over throughout our lives. Iteratively means that we build on and improve with each repetition. Even though we repeat the elements, we're not just spinning in circles without a forward trajectory. Instead, we draw closer to Jesus Christ each time through the cycle. Momentum involves both speed and direction. If I'd paddled the kayak vigorously in the wrong direction, I could have created significant momentum, but I wouldn't have reached the intended destination. Similarly, in life, we need to row toward the Savior to come unto Him. Our faith in Jesus Christ needs to be nourished daily. It's nourished as we pray daily, study the scriptures daily, reflect on the goodness of God daily, repent daily, and follow the promptings of the Holy Ghost daily. Just as it's not healthy to defer eating all our food until Sunday, and then binge our weekly allotment of nutrition. It's not spiritually healthy to restrict our testimony-nourishing behavior to one day in the week. When we assume responsibility for our own testimonies, we gain spiritual momentum and gradually develop bedrock faith in Jesus Christ, and the doctrine of Christ becomes central to the purpose of life. Momentum likewise builds as we strive to obey the laws of God and repent. Repentance is joyful and allows us to learn from our mistakes, which is how we progress eternally. We'll undoubtedly have times when we flip over in our kayaks and find ourselves in deep water. Through repentance, we can get back on top and continue, no matter how many times we've fallen off. The important part is that we do not give up. The next element in the doctrine of Christ is baptism, which includes the baptism of water and, through confirmation, the baptism of the Holy Ghost. While baptism is a singular event, we renew our baptismal covenant repeatedly when we partake of the sacrament. The sacrament doesn't replace baptism, but it links the initial elements in the doctrine of Christ, faith and repentance, with reception of the Holy Ghost. As we conscientiously partake of the sacrament, we invite the Holy Ghost into our lives, just like when we were baptized and confirmed. As we keep the covenant described in the sacrament prayers, the Holy Ghost becomes our companion. As the Holy Ghost exerts a greater influence in our lives, we progressively and iteratively develop Christ-like attributes. Our hearts change. Our disposition to do evil diminishes. Our inclination to do good increases until we only want to do good continually. And we thereby access the heavenly power needed to endure to the end. Our faith has increased, and we're ready to repeat the powerful, virtuous cycle again. Forward spiritual momentum also propels us to make additional covenants with God in the house of the Lord. Multiple covenants draw us closer to Christ and connect us more strongly to Him. Through these covenants, we have greater access to His power. To be clear, Baptismal and temple covenants are not, in and of themselves, the source of power. The source of power is the Lord Jesus Christ and our Heavenly Father. Making and keeping covenants create a conduit for their power in our lives. As we live according to these covenants, we eventually become inheritors to all that Heavenly Father has. The momentum produced by living the doctrine of Christ not only powers the transformation of our divine nature into our eternal destiny, 
but it also motivates us to help others in appropriate ways. Consider how the expedition guide helped me after I flipped over in the kayak. He didn't shout from afar an unhelpful question, such as, Mr. Renland, what are you doing in the water? He didn't paddle up and chide me, saying, Mr. Renland, you wouldn't be in this situation if you were more physically fit. He didn't start towing my kayak while I was just trying to get on top of it. And he didn't correct me in front of the group. Instead, he gave me the help I needed at the time I needed it. He gave me advice when I was receptive, and he went out of his way to encourage me. As we minister to others, we don't need to ask unhelpful questions or state the obvious. Most people who are struggling know that they're struggling. We shouldn't be judgmental. Our judgment is neither helpful nor welcome, and it is most often ill-informed. Comparing ourselves to others can lead us to make pernicious errors, especially if we conclude that we are more righteous than those who are struggling. Such a comparison is like drowning hopelessly in three meters of water, seeing someone else drowning in four meters of water, judging him a greater sinner, and feeling good about yourself. After all, we are all struggling in our own way. None of us earns salvation. We never can. Jacob in the Book of Mormon taught, remember, after we are reconciled unto God, that it is only in and through the grace of God that we're saved. We all need the Savior's infinite atonement, not just part of it. We do need all our compassion, empathy, and love as we interact with those around us. Those who are struggling need to experience the pure love of Jesus Christ reflected in our words and actions. As we minister, we encourage others frequently and offer help. Even if someone isn't receptive, we continue to minister as they allow. The Savior taught that unto such shall ye continue to minister, for ye know not but what they will repent and return and come unto me with full purpose of heart, and I shall heal them, and ye shall be the means of bringing salvation unto them. The Savior's job is to heal. Our job is to love, to love and minister in such a way that others are drawn to Jesus Christ. This is one of the fruits of the powerful, virtuous cycle of the doctrine of Christ. I invite you to live the doctrine of Christ repeatedly, iteratively, and intentionally, and help others on their way. I testify that the doctrine of Christ is central to Heavenly Father's plan. It is, after all, His doctrine. As we exercise faith in Jesus Christ and His Atonement, we're propelled along the covenant path and motivated to help others become faithful disciples of Jesus Christ. We can become heirs in Heavenly Father's kingdom, which is the culmination of faithfully living the doctrine of Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Good morning, dear friends, sisters, and brothers. In the Piper family, we sometimes play a game we call the crazy trust exercise. You may have played it too. Two people stand a few feet apart, one with their back toward the other. On a signal from the person behind, the person in front falls backward into the waiting arms of their friend. Trust is the foundation of all relationships. A threshold question to any relationship is, can I trust the other person? A relationship forms only when people are willing to place trust in each other. It is not a relationship if one person trusts completely, but the other does not. Each of us 
is a beloved spirit son or daughter of a loving Heavenly Father. But while that spiritual genealogy provides a foundation, it does not of itself create a meaningful relationship with God. A relationship can only be built when we choose to trust Him. Heavenly Father desires to build a close, personal relationship with each of His spirit children. Jesus expressed that desire when He prayed, that they all may be one, as Thou, Father, art in me, and I in Thee, that they also may be one in us. The relationship God seeks with each spirit child is one so close and personal that He will be able to share all He has and all He is. That kind of deep, enduring relationship can develop only when built upon perfect, total trust. For His part, Heavenly Father has worked from the beginning to communicate His absolute trust in the divine potential of each of His children. Trust underlies the plan He presented for our growth and progression prior to coming to Earth. He would teach us eternal laws, create an Earth, provide us with mortal bodies, give us the gift to choose for ourselves and permit us to learn and grow by making our own choices. He wants us to choose to follow His laws and return to enjoy eternal life with Him and His Son. Knowing that we would not always make good choices, He also prepared a way for us to escape from the consequences of bad choices. He provided us a Savior, His Son, Jesus Christ, to atone for our sins and make us clean again on condition of repentance. He invites us to use the precious gift of repentance regularly. Every parent knows how difficult it is to trust a child enough to let them make their own decisions, especially when the parent knows the child is likely to make mistakes and suffer as a result. Yet Heavenly Father allows us to make the choices that will help us reach our divine potential. As Elder Dale G. Renlund taught, his goal in parenting is not to have his children do what is right. It is to have his children choose to do what is right and ultimately become like him. Notwithstanding God's trust in us, our relationship with him will grow only to the degree we are willing to place our trust in him. The challenge is that we live in a fallen world and have all experienced a betrayal of trust as the result of dishonesty, manipulation, coercion, or other circumstances. Once betrayed, we may struggle to trust again. These negative trust experiences with imperfect mortals may even impact our willingness to trust in a perfect Heavenly Father. Several years ago, two friends of mine, Leonid and Valentina, expressed interest in becoming members of the Church. As Leonid began to learn the gospel, he found it difficult to pray. Earlier in his life, Leonid had suffered from manipulation and control by superiors and had developed a distrust of authority. These experiences affected his ability to open his heart and express personal feelings to Heavenly Father. With time and study, Leonid gained a better understanding of God's character and experienced feeling God's love. Eventually, prayer became a natural way for him to express thanks and the love he was feeling for God. His increasing trust in God eventually led him and Valentina to enter into sacred covenants to strengthen their relationship with God and each other. If prior loss of trust is keeping you from trusting God, please follow Leonid's example. Patiently continue to learn about Heavenly Father, His character, His attributes, and His purposes. Look for and record experiences feeling His love and power in your life. 
our living prophet, President Russell M. Nelson, has taught that the more we learn about God, the easier it will be for us to trust Him. Sometimes the best way to learn to trust God is simply by trusting Him. Like the crazy trust exercise, sometimes we just need to be willing to fall backward and let Him catch us. Our mortal life is a test. Challenges that stretch us beyond our own capacity come frequently. When our knowledge and understanding are inadequate, we naturally seek for resources to help us. In an information-saturated world, there is no shortage of sources promoting their solutions to our challenges. However, the simple time-tested counsel in Proverbs provides the best advice. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. We show our trust in God by turning to Him first when confronted with life's challenges. After I finished law school in Utah, our family faced the important decision of where to work and make our home. After counseling with each other in the Lord, we felt directed to move our family to the eastern United States, far from parents and siblings. Initially, things went well, and we felt confirmed in our decision. But then things changed. There was downsizing at the law firm, and I faced the prospect of no job or insurance at the very time our daughter Dora was born with serious medical challenges and long-term special needs. While confronting these challenges, I was extended a call to serve that would require significant time and commitment. I had never faced such a challenge and was overwhelmed. I began to question the decision we had made and its accompanying confirmation. We had trusted in the Lord, and the things were supposed to work out. I had fallen backwards, and it now appeared that no one was going to catch me. One day, the words, Don't ask why, ask what I want you to learn, came distinctly into my mind and heart. Now I was even more confused. In the very moment I was struggling with my earlier decision, God was inviting me to trust Him even more. Looking back, this was a critical point in my life. It was a moment when I realized that the best way to learn to trust God was simply by trusting Him. In the subsequent weeks, I watched with amazement as the Lord miraculously unfolded His plan to bless our family. Good teachers and coaches know that intellectual growth and physical strength can happen only when minds and muscles are stretched. Likewise, God invites us to grow by trusting His spiritual tutoring through soul-stretching experiences. Therefore, we can be sure that whatever trust we may have demonstrated in God in the past, another trust-stretching experience lies yet ahead. God is focused on our growth and progress. He is the master teacher, the complete coach, who is always stretching us to help us realize more of our divine potential. That will always include a future invitation to trust Him just a little bit more. The Book of Mormon teaches the pattern God uses to stretch us in order to build strong relationships with us. In Come, Follow Me, we recently studied about how Nephi's trust in God was tested when he and his brothers were commanded to return to Jerusalem to obtain the brass plates. After their initial attempts failed, his brothers gave up and were ready to return without the plates. But Nephi chose to place his complete trust in the Lord and was successful in obtaining the plates. That experience likely strengthened Nephi's confidence in God when his bow broke and the family was facing starvation in the wilderness. Again, Nephi chose to trust in God and the family was saved. These successive experiences gave Nephi even stronger confidence in God for the enormous 
trust-stretching task he would soon face of building a ship. Through these experiences, Nephi strengthened his relationship with God by consistently and continuously trusting him. God uses the same pattern with us. He extends us personal invitations to strengthen and deepen our trust in him. Each time we accept and act on an invitation, our trust in God grows. If we ignore or decline an invitation, our progress stops until we are ready to act on a new invitation. The good news is that regardless of the trust we may or may not have chosen to place in God in the past, we can choose to trust God today and every day going forward. I promise that each time we do, God will be there to catch us and our relationship of trust will grow stronger and stronger until the day that we become one with him and his son. Then we can declare as Nephi, O Lord, I have trusted in thee, and I will trust in thee forever. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. As directed, the congregation will join the choir in singing Redeemer of Israel. After the singing, we will hear from Elder Patrick Karen, who was ordained an apostle and set apart as a member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles on December 7, 2023. He will be followed by Elder Brian K. Taylor of the Seventy. This is the Sunday morning session of the 194th Annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints.
I'd like to express gratitude for your prayers as I've started the process of adjusting to the call through President Nelson to serve as an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. You can probably well imagine how humbling this has felt and that it's been a time of extraordinary upheaval and sobering self-examination. It is, however, and indeed a great honor to serve the Savior in any capacity and to be engaged with you in sharing the good news of his gospel of hope. Beyond that, it's been said that behind every new apostle stands an astonished mother-in-law. <laughs> I don't know if that has actually been said, but in this case, it certainly could be. And I suspect that the fact that my mother-in-law is no longer with us does nothing to reduce her astonishment. Several months ago, when my wife and I were visiting another country for various church assignments, I woke up early one morning and blearily looked outside the hotel window. Down below, on the busy street, I saw that a roadblock had been set up with a policeman stationed nearby to turn cars around as they reached the barrier. At first, only a few cars traveled along the road and were turned back. But as time went by and traffic increased, queues of cars began to build up. From the window above, I watched as the policeman seemed to take satisfaction in his power to block the flow of traffic and turn people away. In fact, he seemed to develop a spring in his step as if he might start doing a little jig as each car <laughs> approached the barrier. If a driver got frustrated about the roadblock, the policeman didn't appear helpful or sympathetic. He just shook his head and repeatedly pointed in the opposite direction. My friends, my fellow disciples on the road of mortal life, our Father's beautiful plan, even his fabulous plan, is designed to bring you home, not to keep you out. No one has built a roadblock and station someone there to turn you around and send you away. In fact, it's the exact opposite. God is in relentless pursuit of you. He wants all of his children to choose to return to him, and he employs every possible measure to bring you back. Our loving Father oversaw the creation of this very earth for the express purpose of providing an opportunity for you and for me to have the stretching and refining experiences of mortality, the chance to use our God-given moral agency to choose Him, to learn and grow, to make mistakes, to repent, to love God and our neighbor, and to one day return to Him. He sent his precious beloved son to this fallen world to live the full range of human experience, to provide an example for the rest of his children to follow and to atone and redeem. Christ's great atoning gift removes every roadblock of physical and spiritual death that would separate us from our eternal home. Everything about the Father's plan for his beloved children is designed to bring everyone home. What do God's messengers, his prophets, call this plan in Restoration Scripture? They call it the plan of redemption, the plan of mercy, the great plan of happiness, and the plan of salvation which is unto all through the blood of mine only begotten. The intent of the Father's great plan of happiness is your happiness right here, right now, and in the eternities. It is not to prevent your happiness and cause you instead worry and fear. The intent of the Father's plan of redemption is in fact your redemption. 
you're being rescued through the sufferings and death of Jesus Christ, freed from captivity of sin and death. It is not to leave you as you are. The intent of the Father's plan of mercy is to extend mercy as you turn back to him and honor your covenant and fidelity to him. It is not to deny mercy and inflict pain and sorrow. The intent of the Father's plan of salvation is in fact your salvation in the celestial kingdom of glory as you receive the testimony of Jesus Christ and offer your whole soul to him. It is not to keep you out. Does this mean anything goes with regard to how we live our lives? That the way we choose to use our agency doesn't matter? That we can take or leave God's commandments? No, of course not. Surely one of Jesus' most consistent invitations and pleas during his mortal ministry was that we change and repent and come unto him. Fundamentally implicit in all of his teachings to live on a higher plane of moral conduct is a call to personal progression, to transformative faith in Christ, to a mighty change of heart. God wants for us a radical reorientation of our selfish and prideful impulses, the eviction of the natural man for us to go and sin no more. If we believe the intent of the Father's all-reaching plan is to save us, redeem us, extend mercy to us, and thereby bring us happiness, what is the intent of the Son through whom the great plan is brought about? The Son tells us himself, for I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. Jesus' will is the benevolent Father's will. He wants to make it possible for every last one of his Father's children to receive the end goal of the plan, eternal life with them. None is excluded from this divine potential. If you are prone to worry, that you will never measure up, or that the loving reach of Christ's infinite atonement mercifully covers everyone else but not you, then you misunderstand. Infinite means infinite. Infinite covers you and those you love. Nephi explains this beautiful truth. He doeth not anything, save it be for the benefit of the world, for he loveth the world, even that he layeth down his own life, that he may draw all men unto him. Wherefore he commandeth none, that they shall not partake of his salvation. The Savior, the Good Shepherd, goes in search of his lost sheep until he finds them. He's not willing that any should perish. Mine arm of mercy is extended towards you, and whosoever will come, him will I receive. Have ye any that are sick among you? Bring them hither. Have you any that are lame, or blind, or halt, or maimed, or leprous, or that are withered, or that are deaf, or that are afflicted in any manner? Bring them hither, and I will heal them, for I have compassion upon you. He did not cast away the woman with the issue of blood. He did not recoil from the leper. He did not reject the woman taken in adultery. He did not refuse the penitent, no matter their sin. And he will not refuse you or those you love when you bring to him your broken hearts and contrite spirits. That is not his intent or design, nor his plan, purpose, wish, or hope. No, he does not put up roadblocks and barriers. He removes them. He does not keep you out. He welcomes you in. His entire ministry was a living declaration of this intent. Then, of course, there is his atoning sacrifice itself, which is harder for us to understand beyond our mortal capacity to comprehend. But, and this is an important but, we do understand can comprehend the holy, 
saving intent of his atoning sacrifice. The veil of the temple was rent in twain when Jesus died upon the cross, symbolizing that access back to the presence of the Father had been ripped wide open to all who will turn to him, trust him, cast their burdens on him, and take his yoke upon them in a covenant bond. In other words, the Father's plan is not about roadblocks. It never was. It never will be. Are there things we need to do, commandments to keep, aspects of our natures to change? Yes, but with his grace, those are within our reach, not beyond our grasp. This is the good news. I am unspeakably grateful for these simple truths. The Father's design, his plan, his purpose, his intent, his wish, and his hope are all to heal you, all to give you peace, all to bring you and those you love home. Of this, I am a witness. In the name of Jesus Christ, his Son. Amen. We love you, Elder Kieran. May I borrow that accent for 10 minutes? In the New Testament, we learn of blind Bartimaeus who cried out to Jesus, desiring a miracle. Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. And immediately he received his sight. On another occasion, a man in Bethsaida longed for healing. In contrast, this miracle did not come instantly. Rather, Jesus blessed him twice before he was restored. In a third example, the Apostle Paul besought the Lord thrice in his affliction, and yet to our knowledge his earnest supplication was not granted. Three different people, three unique experiences. Thus a question, why do some receive their yearned for miracles quickly while others patiently endure waiting upon the Lord? We may not know the why, yet gratefully we know He who loveth us and doeth all things for our welfare and happiness. God, who sees the end from the beginning, reassures, Thine adversity and thine affliction shall be but a small moment, and they shall be consecrated for thy gain. Helping us find further meaning in our trials, Elder Orson F. Whitney taught, no pain that we suffer, no trial that we experience is wasted. It ministers to our education. All that we patiently endure builds up our characters, purifies our hearts, expands our souls, and makes us more tender and charitable. It is through sorrow and suffering, toil and tribulation that we gain the education that we come here to acquire and which will make us more like our heavenly parents." Close quote. Understanding that the power of Christ would rest upon him in his afflictions, the Apostle Paul said humbly, For when I am weak, then am I strong. Life's trials prove us. Even the Savior learned obedience by and was made perfect through sufferings. And one day he will compassionately declare, Behold, I have refined thee, I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. Coming to trust in God's divine purposes breathes hope into weary souls and kindles determination in seasons of anguish and heartache. Years ago, President Russell M. Nelson shared this valuable insight. As we look at all things with eternal perspective, it will significantly lighten our load. My wife Jill and I recently witnessed this truth in the faithful lives of Holly and Rick Porter, whose 12-year-old son, Trey, passed away in a tragic fire. With hands and feet severely burned in a heroic attempt to save her dear son, Holly later testified in Ward Sacrament meeting of the great peace and joy the Lord had poured out upon her family 
in their anguish, using words such as miraculous, incredible, and amazing. This precious mother's unbearable grief was replaced by surpassing peace with this thought, my hands are not the hands that save. Those hands belong to the Savior. Instead of looking at my scars as a reminder of what I was not able to do, I remember the scars my Savior bears. Holly's witness fulfills our prophet's promise. As you think celestial, you will view trials and opposition in a new light. Elder D. Todd Christofferson stated, I believe that the challenge of overcoming and growing from adversity appealed to us when God presented His plan of redemption in the pre-mortal world. We should approach that challenge now knowing that our Heavenly Father will sustain us, but it is crucial that we turn to Him. Without God, the dark experiences of suffering and adversity tend to despondency, despair, and even bitterness. To avoid the darkness of discontent and instead find greater peace, hope, and even joy during life's difficult challenges, I share three divine principles as invitations. One, stronger faith comes by putting Jesus Christ first. Look unto me in every thought, he declares. Doubt not, fear not. President Nelson teaches, our eternal life is dependent upon our faith in Christ and in His Atonement. As I have wrestled with the intense pain caused by my recent injury, I have felt even deeper appreciation for Jesus Christ and the incomprehensible gift of the Atonement. Think of it. The Savior suffered pains and afflictions and temptations of every kind so that He can comfort us, heal us, and rescue us in times of need. He continued, My injury has caused me to reflect again and again on the greatness of the Holy One of Israel. During my healing, the Lord has manifested His divine power in peaceful and unmistakable ways. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, our Savior encourages. I have overcome the world. Two, brighter hope comes by envisioning our eternal destiny. In speaking of the power inherent in keeping a vision of our Father's incredible promised blessings before our eyes every day, Sister Linda Reeves testified, I do not know why we have the many trials that we have, but it is my personal feeling that the reward is so great, so joyful, and beyond our understanding that in that day of reward, we may feel to say to our merciful, loving Father, was that all that was required? What will it matter what we have suffered here if in the end those trials qualify us for eternal life in the kingdom of God? Close quote. President Nelson shared this insight. Consider the Lord's response to Joseph Smith when he pleaded for relief in Liberty Jail. The Lord taught the prophet that his inhumane treatment would give him experience and be for his good. If thou endure it well, the Lord promised, God shall exalt thee on high. The Lord was teaching Joseph to think celestial and to envision an eternal reward rather than focus on the excruciating difficulties of the day. Joseph's change in perspective brought deepening sanctification as reflected in this letter to a friend. After having been enclosed in the walls of a prison for five months, it seems to me that my heart will always be more tender after this than it was than ever before. I think I never could have felt as I do now if I had not suffered the wrongs that I have suffered. Three. Greater power comes by focusing on joy. During eternity's most crucial, agonizing hours, our Savior did not shrink but partook of the bitter cup. How did He do it? We learn for the joy that was set before Him, Christ endured the cross, His will being swallowed up in the will 
of the Father. This phrase, swallowed up, deeply moves me. My interest was heightened when I learned that in Spanish, swallowed up is translated as consumed, consumidas, in German as devoured, and in Chinese as engulfed. Thus, when life's challenges are most painful and overwhelming, I remember the Lord's promise that we should suffer no manner of affliction save it be swallowed up, consumed, devoured, and engulfed in the joy of Christ. I see in so many of you this joy, which defies mortal comprehension, even though your bitter cups have not yet been removed. Thank you for keeping your covenants and standing as witnesses for God. Thank you for reaching out to bless us all while in your quiet heart is hidden sorrow that the eye can't see. For when you bring the Savior's relief to others, you will find it for yourselves, taught President Camille Johnson. Now return with me to the sacrament meeting where we witnessed the miracle of Holly Porter's family being succored by the Lord. On the stand, while pondering what I might say to offer comfort to this remarkable family and their friends, this thought came. Use the Savior's words. So I close today, as I did on that Sabbath, with His words, which healeth the wounded soul. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I will also ease the burdens which are put upon your shoulders, that even you cannot fill them upon your backs, even while you are in bondage, that ye may know of a surety that I, the Lord God, do visit my people in their afflictions. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. With joyful reverence, I witness our Savior lives, and His promises are sure. Especially for you who are troubled or who are afflicted in any manner, I testify that our Heavenly Father hears your tearful pleadings and will always respond in perfect wisdom. May God grant unto you, as He has done for our family in times of great need, that your burdens may be light, even swallowed up in the joy of Christ. In the holy name of Jesus Christ, amen. We are grateful to those who have spoken and are grateful to the Tabernacle Choir at Temple Square for the beautiful music they have provided this morning. The choir will now favor us with His Eye is on the Sparrow, our concluding speaker for this session will be President Dallin H. Oaks, first counselor in the First Presidency. Following his remarks, the choir will close this meeting by singing, Lord, I would follow thee. The benediction will then be offered by Elder Adrian Achoa of the 70.
How does your church differ from others? My answer to this important question has varied as I have matured and as the church has grown. When I was born in Utah in 1932, our church membership was only about 700,000, clustered mostly in Utah and nearby states. At that time, we had only seven temples. Today, the membership of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints numbers more than 17 million in about 170 nations. As of this April 1st, we have 189 dedicated temples in many nations and 146 more in planning and construction. I have felt to speak about the purpose of these temples and the history and role of covenants in our worship. This will supplement the inspired teachings of earlier speakers. A covenant is a commitment to fulfill certain responsibilities. Personal commitments are essential to the regulation of our individual lives and to the functioning of society. This idea is currently being challenged. A vocal minority oppose institutional authority and insists that persons should be free from any restrictions that limit their individual freedom. Yet we know from millennia of experience that persons give up some individual freedoms to gain the advantages of living in organized communities. Such relinquishments of individual freedoms are principally based on commitments or covenants expressed or implied. Here are some examples of covenant responsibilities in our society. Judges, military, medical personnel, and firefighters. All of those involved in these familiar occupations make a commitment, often formalized by oath or covenant, to perform their assigned duties. The same is true of our full-time missionaries. Distinctive clothing or name tags are intended to signify that the wearer is under covenant and therefore has a duty to teach and serve and should be supported in that service. A related purpose is to remind the wearers of their covenant responsibilities. There is no magic in their distinctive clothing or symbols, only a needed reminder of the special responsibilities the wearers have assumed. This is also true of the symbols of the engagement and wedding rings and their role in giving notice to observers or reminding wearers of covenant responsibilities. What I've said about covenants being a foundation for the regulation of individual lives applies particularly to religious covenants. The foundation and history of many religious affiliations and requirements are based on covenants. For example, the Abrahamic covenant is fundamental to several great religious traditions. It introduces the holy idea of God's covenant promises with his children. The Old Testament frequently refers to God's covenant with Abraham and his seed. The first part of the Book of Mormon, which was written during the Old Testament period, clearly demonstrates the role of covenants in the Israelite history and worship. Nephi was told that the Israelite writings of that period were, quote, a record of the Jews which contains the covenants of the Lord which he hath made unto the house of Israel, end of quote. The books of Nephi make frequent reference to the Abrahamic covenant and to Israel as the covenant people of the Lord. 
The practice of covenanting with God or religious leaders is also recorded in the Book of Mormon writings about Nephi, Joseph in Egypt, King Benjamin, Alma, and Captain Moroni. When the time came for the restoration of the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ, God called a prophet, Joseph Smith. We do not know the full content of the angel Moroni's early instructions to this maturing young prophet. We do know he told Joseph that God had a work for him to do and that the fullness of the everlasting gospel must be brought forth, including the promises made to the fathers. We also know that the scriptures young Joseph read most intensively, even before he was directed to organize a church, were the many teachings about covenants he was translating in the Book of Mormon. That book is the Restoration's major source for the fullness of the gospel, including God's plan for his children, and the Book of Mormon is filled with references to covenants. Being well read in the Bible, Joseph must have known of the book of Hebrews reference to the Savior's intent to, quote, make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, end of quote. Hebrews also refers to Jesus as the mediator of the new covenant. Significantly, the biblical account of the Savior's mortal ministry is titled the New Testament, a virtual symbol for the new covenant. Covenants were foundational in the restoration of the gospel. This is evident in the earliest steps the Lord directed the prophet to take in organizing his church. As soon as the Book of Mormon was published, the Lord directed the organization of his restored church, soon to be named the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Revelation given in April 1830 directs that persons shall, quote, be received by baptism into his church, unquote, after they witness, which means solemnly testify, quote, that they have truly repented of all their sins and are willing to take upon them the name of Jesus Christ, having a determination to serve him to the end, end of quote. This same revelation directs that the church, quote, meet together often to partake of bread and wine, water, in the remembrance of the Lord Jesus Christ, end of quote. The importance of this ordinance is evident in the words of covenants specified for the elder or priest who officiates. He blesses the emblems of the bread for the souls of all those who partake of it that they, quote, witness unto thee, O God, the eternal Father, that they are willing to take upon them the name of thy Son and always remember him and keep his commandments which he has given them, end of quote. The central role of covenants in the newly restored church was reaffirmed in the preface the Lord gave for the first publication of his revelations. There, the Lord declares that he has called Joseph Smith because the inhabitants of the earth, quote, have strayed from mine ordinances and have broken mine everlasting covenant, end of quote. This revelation further explains that his commandments are being given that mine everlasting covenant might be established. Today, we understand the role of covenants in the restored church and the worship of its members. President Gordon B. Hinckley gave this summary of the effect of our baptism and our weekly partaking of the sacrament. He said, every member of this church who has entered the waters of baptism has become a party to a sacred covenant 
Each time we partake of the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, we renew that covenant." End of quote. We've been reminded by many speakers at this conference that President Russell M. Nelson often refers to the plan of salvation as the covenant path that, quote, leads us back to God and is all about our relationship with God, end of quote. He teaches about the significance of covenants in our temple ceremonies and urges us to see the end from the beginning and to think celestial. Now I speak more of temple covenants. In fulfillment of his responsibility to restore the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the prophet Joseph Smith spent much of his final years directing the construction of a temple in Nauvoo, Illinois. Through him, the Lord revealed sacred teachings, doctrine, and covenants for his successors to administer in temples. There, persons who were endowed were to be taught God's plan of salvation and invited to make sacred covenants. Those who lived faithful to those covenants were promised eternal life, wherein all things are theirs and they shall dwell in the presence of God and His Christ forever. The endowment ceremonies in the Nauvoo Temple were administered just before our early pioneers were expelled to begin their historic trek to the mountains in the West. We have the testimonies of many pioneers that the power they received from being bound to Christ in their endowments in the Nauvoo Temple gave them the strength to make their epic journey and establish themselves in the West. Persons who have been endowed in a temple are responsible to wear a temple garment, an article of clothing not visible because it is worn beneath outer clothing. It reminds endowed members of the sacred covenants they have made and the blessings they have been promised in the Holy Temple. To achieve those holy purposes, we are instructed to wear temple garments continuously, with the only exceptions being those obviously necessary. Because covenants do not take a day off, to remove one's garments can be understood as a disclaimer of the covenant responsibilities and blessings to which they relate. In contrast, persons who wear their garments faithfully and keep their temple covenants continually affirm their role as disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is constructing temples all over the world. Their purpose is to bless the covenant children of God with temple worship and with the sacred responsibilities and powers and unique blessings of being bound to Christ they receive by covenant. The Church of Jesus Christ is known as a church that emphasizes making covenants with God. Covenants are inherent in each of the ordinances of salvation and exaltation this restored church administers. The ordinance of baptism and its associated covenants are requirements for entrance into the celestial kingdom. The ordinances and associated covenants of the temple are requirements for exaltation in the celestial kingdom which is eternal life, the greatest of all the gifts of God. That is the focus of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I testify of Jesus Christ, who is the head of that Church, and invoke His blessings on all who seek to keep their sacred covenants. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen.
our beloved Heavenly Father. We love thee and thy Son, Jesus Christ. We love and are grateful for our prophets, seers, and revelators and their guidance throughout this conference and throughout our life. We're grateful for all of those that are striving to help us move forward in this beautiful and joyous world where there is also confusion. We ask thee, Heavenly Father, to help us go forward with joy and strive steady, fast hanging to the covenants that we have made. We're grateful for all the blessings that we're constantly receiving. We ask that we can stay steady, fast, and strong from the temptations of the world and the vanities that come with it. We love thy Son, and in his name, we thank thee, Heavenly Father, even our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. This has been a broadcast of the Sunday morning session of the 194th Annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Speakers were selected from leaders of the church. Music for this session was provided by the Tabernacle Choir at Temple Square. This broadcast has been furnished as a public service by Bonneville Distribution. Any reproduction, recording, transcription, or other use of this program without written consent is prohibited.